Pochim ben Pechor Achsanya. I want to begin by thanking our host for the evening, Associated Hebrew Schools, Dr. Mark Smiley, Rabbi Grisman, um, for really their openness and willingness to hope, which we think is a very important and in many ways a long overdue program. Uh, we hope that we will uh, have an opportunity to address many of the issues. We have a wonderful panel. And to say words of introduction, I call on the rabbi of the Beit, Rabbi Karabin. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank Torah and Motion for initiating this conversation tonight. Um, I prepared just a couple of comments, if you'll allow me. Va'ahavtemes hager ki gerim he'yisem ve'eretz Mitzrayim. Torah says, according to Maimonides, it's no less than 37 times that we have an obligation to love the stranger because we know what it means to be treated as an outsider, as a less than, as someone who's told you don't belong. For too long, our communities, and by that I mean Orthodox Jewish communities, have been perhaps less than stellar in our fulfillment of this mitzvah. There's a lot of xenophobia, judgmentalism, and wariness of the stranger. And certainly, we have not properly fulfilled the mitzvah of loving the stranger and the outsider when it comes to the gay community. So part of the purpose of this evening, at least in my eyes, is to begin the conversation here in Toronto and to try to welcome the gay members of our community into our shuls and our homes. It's to try and do a bit of tshuva for making people feel unwelcome and to offer the warm embrace of unconditional love regardless of one's orientation. But it doesn't stop there. We need to talk more about the issues today revolving around gender and sexual orientation. I think as sort of a first step, we need, to, we need to remind ourselves that there's no prohibition in the Torah for having a sexual orientation. The Torah never says, thou shalt not be gay. There's pretty much a consensus, even among very from Jews, that people are born with proclivities and orientations. And thus, HaKadosh Baruch Hu can't tell me to not be something that he made me to be. What the Torah does prohibit, and here from the Orthodox perspective, there is no room for interpretation, is homosexual behavior. Anyone who tells you otherwise that this is not prohibited is certainly entitled to their opinion, but that's, not, that's simply not the orthodox halachic understanding. And this is the difficulty inherent to the situation the orthodox world finds itself in today. We are living in a time when gender identity is becoming more and more fluid and is something that is becoming less and less relevant so that one's gender society tells us is just like hair color or eye color. But that's society's direction. The Torah, on the other hand, does place very strong emphasis on gender. Men have defined roles and commandments. Women have defined roles and commandments. That's not to say that every man can fulfill every male-oriented mitzvah, and the same thing for females. But to say that gender is fluid or unimportant is simply anathema to the traditional Jewish view. And so based on these facts on the ground, we find ourselves in a bit of a quandary. On a human level, my mission as an Orthodox Jew, and especially as an Orthodox rabbi, is to provide love and support for those who feel the most lonely, the most estranged, and the most in need of a strong shoulder of support. That is why, personally, I make it a priority to spend more time with those who view themselves as strangers, as the other, and that includes the gay members of my community. They share with me their struggles between their religious identity and their sexual identity. And I sympathize and I try to be there for them as much as possible. My friends in the gay community know that I'm not going to give them a free pass to do whatever they want. But they also know that I'm not going to judge them for what they do or don't do, just as I wouldn't judge any member of my community when they share with me their most vulnerable and intimate secrets. There is a movement afoot to create safer spaces for gay people in the Orthodox community. That's a good thing, that's appropriate, and I support that effort completely. But let's be clear, and I speak on behalf of, of myself and my community. 
that's quite different from the expectation that some have that an Orthodox community should accept and celebrate the gay lifestyle as a viable alternative to the nuclear family. As far as I can tell from my perch in the Orthodox community, that will not be happening anytime soon. And so to the members of the gay community who would like to be part of the Orthodox community, I would like you to know that I want to be your friend. I am here to accept you unconditionally, and I promise you a judgment-free friendship. I am here for you to lean on, to receive um, emotional support, and anything else I can do for you. But I have one request for you. Don't ask a cat to bark or a dog to meow. You understand that an Orthodox rabbi and community cannot endorse or celebrate gay marriage and the gay lifestyle. I won't ask you to change who you are. Please don't ask me to change who I am and the Torah that I represent to change what it is. I know that for some in my community, I am speaking inappropriately. There are those in the Orthodox community who believe that gay people should not have a place at all in our shul. To those I say, I'm sorry, we will have to disagree. My compassion and love for my fellow Jew will not allow me to reject anyone from the house of Hashem for any reason. For others, I'm speaking inappropriately because they feel that we have to do more to celebrate the gay lifestyle. To those I also say, I'm sorry, but we'll have to disagree. My commitment as a rabbi is, despite the fact that it may be painful to others for me to do that, to do this, but is to be faithful to the Torah and to the Shulchan Aruch and to leave it intact and in the same way that I received it. You know, there's a person in our community who stopped believing in God because one of her children recently passed away. I will struggle with all my strength to bring peace to that person, not because I have a religious duty to make that person believe again, but rather because I have a duty to love that person and make that broken person whole. We know that about Judaism in the Torah we say, the Torah's pathways are pleasant, and all of its roads are, lead to peace. My pledge to you, as it is for any Jew who is struggling with any part of the Torah, is to work with you to find a way to make the Torah as pleasant and embracing as possible. Thank you. Okay, good evening. I'm Dr. Elliot Malamud. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, and I'd especially like to thank our sponsors for this evening, Harry Coster and Murray Newman, in memory of their parents. May their Nishamot have an Aliyah. We're very grateful for your support. Um, I'm actually not going to give any preamble remarks, except to say that this is one of those issues that's very complicated and there's strong feelings on all sides of the spectrum, I would simply say that the most valuable thing to do is to listen. In that vein, I would like to introduce our speakers for this evening uh, in alphabetical order. On my right here, Rabbi Steve Greenberg, who has rabbinic ordination from Yeshiva University, is a senior teaching fellow and director of diversity project at Kalal, the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership. He's the author of the book, Wrestling with God and Men, Homosexuality in the Jewish Tradition, which received the Kora Jewish Book Award for Philosophy and Thought in 2005. He's also the founder and director of ASHEL, which is a support, education, and advocacy organization for Orthodox LGBT Jews. He's on the faculty of the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America. Rabbi Greenberg was featured in the 2001 film, Trangling Before God, and in 2011 officiated what is believed to be the first same-sex marriage in the United States performed by an ordained Orthodox rabbi, marrying two Jewish men in a legal marriage in Washington according to the laws of the District of Columbia. Next to him on my immediate right, Ishai Grossman, who went to chat and it was my privilege to have him as my student there. He has a BA in McGill uh, in physiology. He studied in the Pardes Institute of Jewish Studies and is, will be attending medical school in the fall. We're not supposed to say which one because we're still trying to figure that out. <laughs> Um, over on the left here, Dr. Marshall Kornblum is the psychiatrist in chief at the Hinks Delcrest Center for Children in Toronto and the associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. 
He's on the staff of the Youth Psychiatry Division of Sunnybrook and Women's College Hospital. He's been practicing child psychiatry for over 25 years. He's consulted JF and CS as well as the Toronto and North York Boards of Education. And he has a private practice in adolescent psychiatry. He's won numerous teaching awards and has published in the area of depression and personality order, disorder in adolescence. On the far left, Rabbi Chaim Rappaport, who was born in Manchester, England, attended the Yeshivot of Manchester, Gateshead, Torah Demet in Jerusalem, and the Central Lubavitch Yeshiva in New York. He's the author of the 2004 book, Judaism and Homosexuality, an Authentic Orthodox View. He's been the Rav of synagogues in Birmingham and Ilford. He was the member of Chief Rabbi Sachs' cabinet and advisor to him on medical ethics. He has consulted globally on issues related to orthodoxy and LGBT. Rabbi Rapport established Makor Mayim Chaim, an institution to which he promotes his Jewish teachings and disseminates perspectives on a broad range of subjects. Immediately to my left, Mrs. Carol Seedman. He's been an outstanding community professional for many years, and is well known to many of you, with service in the UJ Federation of Greater Toronto, Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation of the Mount Sinai Hospital, as well as many other organizational contributions. She's been a frequent guest lecturer and popular media personality. She's been featured in City One Magazine, National Post Business, Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, CJN, the recipient of many honors, including the Karen McGibbon Award of Excellence and the Milosh Monix Prize, the Gold Medal, she obtained her certified fundraising executive designation in 1999 and was recertified many times. Please welcome our panelists. We wanted to start this evening just by giving you the experience of what it means to discover, to find out your sexual orientation or identity, the process that you go through, and how you come out on the other side. We're going to begin with Rabbi Greenberg. I wanted to ask you how you went through, how it began, that you discovered and believed that you were gay. When did you know this first? What did you do at that time? And there was phases to this, so how and when did you come to be open about it? Uh, I grew up in uh, Columbus, Ohio in the 1970s. So there weren't words to describe the feelings of a kid who sensed that there was something deeply dangerous about his inner life but had no way to put words to it. I mean, I mean, I guess it's, you know, somebody, somebody in the playground could have been called a faggot, but that meant unathletic. I had no language for the experience of uh, excitement around boys. I had no way to put words to it. And my, 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 my mother is a Holocaust survivor. And the only relative in Columbus we had was my Uncle Al, who lost his entire family. We used to go to, wed to, to um, Seder's, and the, and the cousins of Al's wife, we only saw on Seder. And she had a, 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 a beautiful teenage son that I spent those entire Seder's staring at. My brother, a couple years younger, stared at this young man's sister, who was equally gorgeous. And my mother would talk endlessly about how Mark stared at Jackie. No one could see that I was fixated on Terry. So that's what it's like growing up, is that I felt like there was something dangerous about my inner life. I had no language for it. I go off, I kind of become really from at 15. You know, Nagia is a helpful thing when you need a mask. Because that way, I had an excuse for why I wasn't behaving or acting. And I was so from, that's why I wasn't touching girls or playing into the teenage romance bit. I went off to yeshiva and loved it and then ended up at Gush Etzion. And finally, by the age of 20, I, uh, the repression breaks, you know, just wears thin. And I feel clearly physically attracted to another guy in the yeshiva. And I don't know what to do. I'm terrified. And I realize that I've been feeling these attractions for a long time. I just haven't faced it. And I went at the time. I didn't want to go. I was at the Gush, you know, Yeshiva Tarzion. I didn't want to go to the Roche Yeshiva there in my modern Orthodox space. I went to the most right-wing Orthodox rabbi I could find because I knew the information would never get from there to where I was studying. 
So I went to Rav Yosef Sholem El Yoshiv. Now Rav El Yoshiv was a Haredi posek, and I went all the way to Unsdorf. I sat in front of him, spoke in Hebrew, he didn't speak English, and I said, Harav, Ani nimshach legvarim v'lenashim. That's how I understood myself. Master, I'm attracted to both men and women. I assumed I was attracted to women, because everybody is, all men are, and I'm attracted to men, because I felt it. This is what he said to me. Yedidi yikari, my dear one, my friend. Yesh lecha koach ahava pi shnaim. You have twice the power of love. Tishtamesh baze bezihirut. Use it carefully. I was like mesmerized. I was like, I couldn't figure out what to do. I said, Yesh l'rav odagid, does the master have anything else to say to me? He smiled and said, En li af mila yoter. Shalom. I left, I danced my way back to the gush. Because I thought, wow, twice the power of love, I'll be a great rabbi. I would, like, you know, I thought I could marry a woman and have kids. And, you know, I was so excited that here's the thing I wasn't asking is it permissible for me to have sex with a man I wasn't ready to ask that question I was just asking is this ugly it's called Toeva in the Torah is it ugly and he said to me no no my dear one it's not it's love I went back to New York City after yeshiva and finished and went to rabbinical school and loved learning and increasingly over 15 years tried to date and failed and realized that I would put both myself and a woman that I would be with in a horrible you know, uh, you know, bind that would be impossible, painful, and destructive. And finally, at the age of 35, I finally decided that it was time to at least say the words to myself, I am gay. The reason I didn't say those words for 15 years is because those words would have put me at the edge of a cliff. Because every future a young person is given in this community is a future with marriage and kids. All good futures were heterosexual, were straight. Their only future for a gay person was ignominy, shame, death, illness. Like, I, how could you say I am gay? My, I would feel those words said to myself, I'd be at the edge of a cliff with no possible good future. And so it took me 15 years. That is really in the end what this conversation for us is about, is how do we provide an arc of a good life for a young person who realize, realizes that this is the way Hashem made me. So I guess I have a similar experience uh, that I want to share with you, I guess, growing up in the Sher Shemayim community in Toronto. Um, I guess to start off, I, I'm going to try to be pretty honest and open, because I think that's the best way to have these discussions and actually get to the, um, the main points. But so to start, I guess, I really... Um, I had a pretty normal upbringing. I went to Jewish school. I, went, I was pretty involved at Church of Mayim. Um, started a teen minion in my high school years. Uh, played hockey in Avenue Road. Um, I went to McGill. Pretty, pretty typical up upbringing. And um, Judaism, Judaism was always at the center of that. I always, uh, even at Chad, I always wore my kippah and tzitzit out. Um, I was always... Uh, very proud to be Jewish. Um, I guess relating to the, what we're talking about tonight, I started um, probably around 12 or 13. I noticed that I happened to be thinking about guys, um, I guess, in my private time. And I wasn't sure exactly what that meant. I, I didn't think it was... Um, anything came of it, I didn't think it meant that I was gay or anything. Um, 
I just thought, oh, I just happened to, that's what I maybe was attracted to, but um, I thought it was a bad thing for several reasons, I think, both from the community and possibly the religion, so I ended up feeling pretty miserable about having those feelings. Um, so I would try to stop. I would, um, during, during davening, I would uh, pray really hard to, not so much pray the gay way, because again, I didn't think I was gay at all, um, but it was more just like, give me the power to stop um, having these th feelings about guys. Stop, um, you know, this wasn't me, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't doing this, it was just me in my weak moments uh, that I happened to think about this. So I, that, would, that would work for about two weeks, two or three weeks, and then I would think about guys again. Um, and I'd feel miserable about it again. And then I would say I would stop, and I really tried, I put all my willpower into it, with Dovin really hard, and I was like, okay, finally stopped. And then two or three weeks later, the same thing would happen. Um, so these kind of cycles of going through, um, trying to stop and then feeling bad about it, um, it really continued from around 12 or 13 throughout high school, um, and especially I don't know how you did it, but for me it was uh, <laughs> every, every, every time you try to stop and fail, it really just, it gets to you. And at a certain point you just realize that, um, I guess, I started feeling miserable about failing as well. Um, mm. And so I would, uh, the thing was though, that I had this barrier between what I thought in my private time and, and like everyone around me. Like I didn't think of any of my friends in that way, there wasn't really anyone I was attracted, any guys that I was attracted to. Um, it was really just my private time and I had my real life outside. Um, so that continued throughout high school and I went to yeshiva, I went to Gush, and again, going through the same cycles. Um, God was kind of the only person that I, or only thing that I, I spoke to. Uh, he kind of gave me the courage to continue trying to stop. I felt that he was kind of the one with me, and I wasn't really alone because he was with, or he or she was with me there the whole time. Um, so this con continued throughout um, up until uh, second year university, when I kind of this barrier started breaking down. Uh, I kind of, I guess, started thinking about guys in my everyday life during class, walking down the street. I would uh, look at and check out guys, I guess. Um, but the thing was that I still felt miserable about it. So now it wasn't just really something in my private time that I'd feel miserable about on the odd occasion. It was really every single moment that I would look up and see, uh, I guess, someone that I was attracted to. Um, so this kind of escalated to the point of, um, at the end of my second year, when um, I really, I could be hanging out with my friends at one moment and go home and uh, feel all alone, uh, no one to speak to. And um, as well, I could, during davening, you know, be joking with friends, talking during davening um, at one moment, and then during the Amida, really be begging for God to, again, give me the courage to stop and to, um, to, uh, yeah, stop. So this took me up until the summer, which was three years ago, when I decided that um, I had had enough. It had been affecting my relationships with my friends. Um, I felt that it was encroaching on my outside world. I wasn't, um, I wasn't being myself. My grades definitely were affected. I couldn't focus so much on school as all my effort was put into willpower to try to stop these feelings. Uh, so over the summer, I came back to Toronto and I decided that it was time to see if um, these were real feelings because I didn't know. I, um, I wasn't sure if they were just in my mind or if they were actual real feelings. I also just wanted to speak to someone who could maybe relate to my situation uh, so I tried to look for the straight person who happened to think about guys, 
which I guess I now realize is just a gay person. <laughs> but that was my mindset at the time. So I, I went out and um, actually met this uh, Israeli guy who was here for the summer. And I remember the first time we met, we, my, my heart was beating, I had butterflies in my stomach, and it was really the first time that I actually felt attraction to someone in, in real life. Um, and I guess at the same time before, just at the beginning of the summer, I kind of, in my mind, I had these two streams. One was I could either maybe follow my feelings and maybe um, be happy, or I could, um, you know, have a family and be Jewish and all the other things that are extremely important to me. So I really saw those as two opposite ends. Um, if I were to ever follow my feelings, I thought I would have to give up my values, my family, my friends, um, my Judaism. Um, so that was my thinking at the beginning of the summer. After the summer, after spending some time with this guy and realizing that these were real feelings, and in my mind, I guess I rationalized that, you know, I was lucky to be attracted to someone. Um, so I thought they were real feelings and they were okay, or maybe even good feelings to have. Um, and at that time, I guess I, so at the end of the summer, I, in terms of the two, two streams, I saw it as, on one hand, I could, um, you know, be um, attracted, or I could follow and maybe be happy with the guy, um, or, and still be Jewish, because I realized I didn't necessarily have to give everything up, but on the other hand, I could um, have a family, which is very important to me, and children. And, and um, I guess I saw those as two extremes. Uh, eventually, after that summer, I went back to school and kind of everything came crashing down from before the summer. Um, I didn't have anyone to speak to. I felt all the loneliness and miserable feelings coming crashing back. And I think it was kind of at that point that I realized that I would always be miserable if I didn't follow my feelings and that it wouldn't be fair for me or for if I were to marry a woman. It for sure it wouldn't be fair to her if I um, wasn't able to love her fully. And I realized that I needed, the only realistic option for me was um, to pursue something with, um, or follow my feelings for you guys. I just want to pop yeah. in for one sec. Sorry. Does anybody, have you spoken to anybody about this yet? In other words, does anybody know about this? Your parents, your friends, is this all private at this point? Uh, Except for the Israeli guy, in other words? No, um, yeah, at, up until that point, I still had not told someone. And this is when? This is That was uh, 2013, I guess, October. So until two and a half years ago, absolutely nobody knows your whole life. Yeah, so your, for, your life. for nine years before that, I, um, I guess, other than God, no one, no one knew. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess in terms of, I guess I can walk you through, because before, before I, um, I guess there's just the fear of not knowing how people react, the fear of um, rejection. And um, yeah, I guess those are, and those are the main fears I, I, I would say that would stop me from, that had stopped me from speaking to someone about it. Um, I guess it's kind of similar to like when you're a kid and you do badly on a test and you don't really want to tell your parents, just like that, but times a thousand maybe. Um, so yeah, so that was really when I accepted and I realized that these two streams um, one wasn't really available to me and that I'd always be miserable if I, if I um, ended up with a woman and that I would um, be attracted to men. Um, so how, yeah. We're going to come back to you. Um, I just want to ask you one final question for the moment. So who's the first person you tell? So, uh, sorry. <laughs> it's pretty much um, around... Around that time, around October, I told my, one of my best friends, um, who happened to be my roommate at the time, and that was 
um, very different, difficult because, again, you're at that peak where no one knows, and once you tell one person, you, you have the potential of everything falling apart if it doesn't go well. Um, I was lucky, I was fortunate that, although he was quite surprised, that um, he reacted with only love and support, and um, I, I'm really lucky and fortunate to have had that amazing experience. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm interested in the, you know, sort of the other side of the dyad, right? Carol, in a sense, it's interesting, like parents of gay kids also have to kind of come out, right? Um, how did you find out that your, your son was gay and, and what was your initial reaction you and your husband. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that because I'm assuming that parents also, you know, Shai spoke movingly and, and so did Rabbi Greenberg about the kind of dreams you have of what you're going to do, get married, have children, and even though these things are available to, to gay people in terms of, you know, surrogacy and adoption and so on, but normatively I'm sure that there was a certain process you went through that would be, it would be difficult. So I wonder if you could describe that for us. Um, our son came out to us in 1995. He was 16, 17 years old, and he told us he was gay. Ten years later, in 2005, Canada led the way as the fourth country in the world to legalize same-sex marriage. Twenty years after he came out, in 2015, Canada was now one of 20 countries, including the U.S., to legalize same-sex marriage. Why do I tell you that? I think that the history is really important because back in 1995, the issue of being LGBT was not only taboo in religious circles, but almost everywhere in Canada and across the world. Our reaction when he told us, as you might expect, was that we were upset, fearful, confused, and sad. We let him know how much we loved him. And I remember one conversation where we said, we believe with all our hearts that we are made in the image of Hashem. And he was, as our son, included in that list. Furthermore, I remember saying, and Hashem doesn't make junk. So we'll figure this out. This having a gay son was very new territory for us. We made mistakes. And we learned as we went along. Because remember, this was in the dark ages of 1995. We were going to build and fly the plane at the same time. The first ignorant thing we did as parents in our vulnerable and alone state was we kept our son's sexual identity a secret. There wasn't Facebook at the time. And um, other than jokes and slurs, the LGBT topic was not one that came up in conversations in our circle of shul friends and neighbors. And as parents, we feared for our son's well-being, and we worried about his future, and the future of our daughter, who was four years younger. And at the time of his coming out, she had just graduated from Eitz Chaim and was only in her first year at Opana. So what a heavy load and a big secret for her to be carrying around, in addition to all the other pressures of growing up. In those dark early days, we worried every single day that our son would be at constant risk of bullying, shaming, and self-loathing. We were on the lookout for depression and signs of self-harm. The biggest fear, of course, is suicide. Despite our love and acceptance and doing the best we knew how to do at the time to protect him and our family, our son experienced excruciating pain in those years. Having a shul program or a JCC program maybe could have gone a long way to help all of us, but none were available. And also at the time, if I'm going to be really honest, my impulse wouldn't have been to go to anything because you want to hide under the rug and you don't want to see anyone. The last thing you're going to want to do is go to a community program. But the irony is that's exactly what you need. You need the support of others. So. Who knew that that's what we needed? And it didn't matter because they didn't exist. For some of you tonight, whether here in this room or via live streaming, 
the daunting task of first stepping into a public space that Torah in Motion has so brilliantly put together is huge. I remember the very first time, and it was only eight years ago, that it was Rabbi Stephen Greenberg's program at Hillel, at the Wolfon Center at the University of Toronto, that got Peter and me to get in the car and drive to the University of Toronto and park. And I remember every slow motion step of getting out of the car, into the building, and walking down, it was in the basement, every step of the way to that program. Because as Elliot said, it was our coming out. I didn't know who was going to be in that room. Peter didn't know who was going to be in that room. It was a huge thing to do. Thank God we did it. It was one of the best nights for us because we saw we weren't alone. And that's why I'm so happy to be part of this panel because we are not alone and we keep seeing that and feeling it. It gets easier. Uh, the freedom of letting go of a secret gives you personal satisfaction of being real with people, which is what Yeshaya so beautifully and eloquently described about being real with his feelings. And what you find out is the risk is very worthwhile taking when you can be real about who your family is and who your son is. We learned when we spoke the truth, and in most cases, our family, our friends, our community members embraced us. And they also showed us their own struggles, and we've become closer. Many of these people are in the room tonight. In the few cases where there was harsh judgment and ignorance and stupid comments, we don't make any efforts to stay in touch with those people. And we also use that same litmus test when we talk to friends about Shaduchim, and we say, any family who doesn't accept an LGBT person is not good enough for your family. You know, you begin to start separating the wheat from the chaff. And we do that with our charitable donations. We do it with our choice of friends. We learned a lot along the way. And one of the things that we learned, and Peter reminded me of this the other night, was 15 years ago, in, in the work that I did, I met some of Canada's best leaders, um, industry leaders, community leaders, government people. One of them, the uh, former Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick, Margaret McCain, and her husband Wallace, who you probably, the late Wallace McCain, um, has been known for the potato, french fry, McCain foods empire, once told me a story that has stayed with us for at least these 15 years, and it was she and every major head of every bank and corporation were at a table at the Brazilian ball, and um, someone was about to tell a gay joke. And Margaret said, stop right there. Wallace and I have a daughter who's a lesbian. Bam, end of joke. But hopefully, the beginning of education. And when she shared that story with me, what she did was she shared something much more important than the story. She shared the fact that leaders lead. She didn't care that she was with fancy people or her husband or whoever else's business associates. She cared about doing the right thing. She cared about stopping something that was wrong. And she gave me the language and the words, which I didn't use until many, many years later. And Peter didn't use and Serena hasn't used. But now we know how to speak up when things are wrong. And we've looked to those leaders to find our way through this territory. Um, there's other things I'm going to say, but I promised Elliot I would stop at a certain point, and if there's time, we'll go back to it. Thank you, Carol. <clears throat> so, Rabbi Rappaport, I wanted to turn to you. You've, you've heard actually what, what Carol said, and I know that you spend a good deal of time counseling parents of LGBT kids, and I'm wondering, what's your your main message to them, and, and how do you work with them? My primary message to parents, as well as to gay people themselves, is that the most important thing is to save and maintain people's lives. To 
save and maintain families, not to allow people to be estranged from each other through mutual ostracization, disenfranchisement, so on and so forth. To save communities that a gay person should feel, should not feel rejected by his erstwhile friends from school, from yeshiva, from seminary, should not feel rejected by his rabbi, mentors, and anyone in the community. So, to make sure life is not lost through depression and suicide, families are not broken through xenophobia and alienation. Communities, people, are not lost to their communities because of their orientation. And last, but by no means least, my aim, my goal, and I try as hard as I can to achieve this, is that they should not lose their God. There is good reason for people to do just that. I was speaking to a young man last week in the tri-state area in, uh, in America. And I said to him, he, he was an orthodox gay person, and I asked him, how many people, how many, how many people do you think there are in the tri-state area, like yourself, who wear tzitzis, wear a kippah, keep Shabbos, daven three times a day, and he said, there is a significant number, but not that many. But then he said something very chilling. He said, if you were to ask me how many people there are in this area that were like me, but have now left, the answer would be in the hundreds. And if at the heart of Judaism is the mitzvah of Ahav Tolareach HaKamecha to love your fellow like yourself, it's something which sums up the ethos of the Torah. Then it is incumbent upon us to do whatever we can to make sure that the, self, the physical emotional, mental health of gay people is a priority. The family viability is, is healthy, community, and of course, the relationship between the individual and God. Uh, sometime back, I met a, a fellow Haredi rabbi at a function, and he said, Reb Chaim, I heard you wrote a book. I said, I wrote more than one book. He said, no, I'm referring to a specific book. He couldn't get himself to actually say the title of the book. Anyway, he said to me, what's there to write about already? It's all explicit in the Torah. So I said, if you want, I'll send you a complimentary copy of the book. He said, please don't. Now, we live in a, a situation where there are many rabbis and counselors and even professional counselors who don't understand the tremendous pain, the sense of isolation, both from children and parents. And for them, there's nothing to discuss. If you have a magical formula which will transform gay people and make them heterosexual, then there's what to discuss. But beyond that, there's nothing to talk about. For me, that wasn't part of the discussion at all. For me, it was about saving lives, families, communities, and saving the religious lives 
of so many hundreds and thousands of people. That's my message. That's my goal. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kornblum, um, Robert Rappaport alluded to, um, you know, and, and Carol also, the potential for suicidality and depression. And I know that you've had a number of, of um, gay Orthodox clients in your office. I'm wondering if you can tell me what the, the central themes and issues that arise in the therapy and what you would see as your, your therapeutic goals uh, in working with them. Sure. Um, maybe if I can start with just a reflection on when a person reach, reaches a certain age. Um, something in the newspaper caught my eye and I thought I'd share this with you. Retirement has me feeling like I'm 16 again. Remember that angst? I'm supposed to be grown up by now, so why do I feel so scared and confused? I'll pretend that I'm not. I want to listen to music, watch TV, and just be left alone. What's happening to my body? Hair is growing in the wrong places. I'm unhappy with my skin. I have confusing feelings about sex. I want to eat when and what I want, but keep being told it's not good for me. I hate my hair. Do people like me? What groups should I join? Am I smart enough to learn to play bridge? Am I physically fit enough to curl? What clothes should I wear to flatter my shape? There you have it. Being 16 or 65, the concerns are not so different. As long as you have a plan, you'll be okay, they say. The trouble is, when you're LGBT, it's not so easy to have a plan. But I thought that would be, that's an interesting kind of reflection, comparing what it's like to be 16 and 65 and worrying about your body and your appearance and acceptance and all that stuff. Give me so much to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I thought I would also start off my comments with a bit of a quiz. It's probably impossible for me not to have a quiz. I'm a teacher. I teach residents, I teach medical students all the time. I'm always quizzing them. So I'm going to throw out a quiz to you. And the question is, who said this and when? If someone is gay and searches for God and has good will, who am I to judge? A person once asked me in a provocative manner if I approved of homosexuality. I replied with another question. Tell me, when God looks at a gay person, does he endorse the existence of this person with love or reject and condemn this person? We must always consider the person. Here, we enter into the mystery of the human being. Any guesses so far as to who said that? Yes. You win the prize, sir. It was the Pope. The Pope said that, and when? Two years ago. Two years ago. Thank you. That's exactly who said it. He also said, I'm glad that we're talking about homosexual people because before all else comes the individual person in his wholeness and dignity. And people should not be defined only by their sexual tendencies. Let us not forget that God loves all his creatures. By thinking that everything is black and white, white we sometimes close off the way of grace and growth. I understand those who prefer a more rigorous pastoral care, which leaves no room for confusion. But I sincerely believe that God's want, God wants us to be attentive to the goodness which the Holy Spirit sows in the midst of human weakness. All of those quotes are from the Pope, all said about two or three years ago. So. I say that obviously because we're not the only religion struggling with this struggle, and I think it helps sometimes to contextualize things. Coming back to some of Elliot's questions, you know, what, what are the central themes and issues that arise when I work with gay Orthodox Jews? I'm a child psychiatrist, so I see mostly adolescents. So my clientele are, are roughly anywhere from the ages of 13 to 20, 25, something like that. Um, my primary goal is always to promote the mental health of my patients. 
Um, that's my number one goal. And as a child psychiatrist, that usually means I'm on the side of promoting development, whatever that may look like. And we know from neuroplasticity and many other studies that no development can evolve in many, many different ways. And thank God for that, that there are many different routes to mental health. And diversity is something that has probably saved the human race from extinction. We need difference to survive. If we were back in the savannas and the jungles and we had only a very small, narrow group of hunters who were not able to anticipate when the lions and the tigers were going to come from all different... And if we didn't learn how to cooperate with our neighbors, we probably would have died thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Diversity has literally saved the human race. And I believe that to be true today, no less. As a therapist, I also know that it's important to respect culture. And I'll tell you a, a brief example of that. So I was treating a, <clears throat> uh, not a gay teenager, but an orthodox teenager whom I had diagnosed with clinical depression. He happened to be the son of a rabbi. And so I was giving feedback to the rabbi, the father, and said, my opinion is that your son has clinical depression. The rabbi said, okay, so what are you recommending for treatment? And I said, um, therapy and medication. And the rabbi thought about it for a minute, and he said, okay, I'm all for that. Which medication are you thinking of? I said, well, the evidence is strongest for Prozac. And he said, okay, that's fine. Is Prozac kosher? I said, I don't know. Nobody's ever asked me that question before. I have no clue. So I phoned up the local pharmacist, where I usually send all my prescriptions to, and I asked him, what are the ingredients in Prozac? And wouldn't you know it, one of the ingredients is gelatin, animal fat. Okay. So now we had a problem. The, the rabbi was okay with his son going on medication, but the medication had to be kosher. So I called up Murray Shore, and. Uh, you know, said, look, Murray, can you, can you reformulate the Prozac in a way that does not have animal fat in it? And he said, of course I can. So he, put, he reformulated the Prozac capsules in a way that was met all the criteria for kashrut. And uh, the rabbi gave, gave it the heksher, and the boy started taking Prozac. And within three months, he was much, much better. All the depressive symptoms had disappeared pretty much. And he carried on his way with therapy, and, and he had a very good outcome. So I learned that in order, I can make all the recommendations I want, I have to respect culture. If I couldn't have offered that young man and his parent a therapy that was respectful of his culture and his religion, I would have lost the patient. They, they would have gone elsewhere and not complied with my recommendation and the boy would probably still be depressed today. So respect and culture has to be factored into any therapeutic manage, management plan. To me, the central issues of adolescence are believing and belonging. A sense of belief. This is the existential struggle of adolescence. Why am I here? Why am I on this earth? What is my purpose? And belief, of course, includes spirituality. And belonging. All teenagers, all people, want to be part of a group. And which group that is, is their struggle. So those are the central themes. Now, when I'm seeing a person who is LGBT and orthodox, what I can say is those struggles are heightened because there's a conflict now between the believing and the belonging. And healthy development happens most easily when the believing and the belonging go together and there isn't a conflict. If there's a conflict between the believing and the belonging, that's when you see all kinds of mental health problems. And, and, you know, Elliot was asking me about, you know, depression rates or suicide rates amongst the LGBT community. Yes, the suicide rates, uh, attempted suicide and suicide rates are much higher. But the ha that has to be viewed in a context. So the question is, are those kids being rejected by their parents, by their friends, by their community, or are they being accepted? So there was one study done at San Francisco State University that compared LGBT young people who were not rejected 
with those who were highly rejected. And this is where the findings really come out. Those who were rejected had more than eight times, were more than eight times as likely to have attempted suicide, nearly six times as likely to report high levels of depression, and more than three times as likely to use illegal drugs. The variable wasn't the homosexuality, the variable was the acceptance. Okay. So when we look at these high suicide, higher suicide rates in the LGBT community, we have to again contextualize it to, well, are they being allowed to come out? Are they being allowed to come out to themselves, as we've heard before? Um, so it, it's definitely a problem when there's rejection. The rejection can be in the external environment, their parents, their friends, their school, or one can have internalized homophobia, and that is when you really get uh, difficult depression. Thank you. Um, so, there, Rabbi Greenberg, there seems to be a, like, there's a theme that keeps coming up again and again and again, which is there, there's, the, there's the tremendous struggle of self-discovery, but then there's the, the second phase, which is who do I talk to? Who do I tell? Who's going to accept me? Who's not? And I was intrigued that Aishel did a study um, in which Orthodox parents of LGBT children report that only 9% of them, so a very small figure, go to their rabbi first for guidance uh, when they find out that a child is gay. Um, what's interesting about that is those very self-same Jews might go to their rabbis for a number of other issues of their lives, but they won't go on this. So why is that, do you think? And, and what can Orthodox rabbis do to make gay Jews and their families more comfortable in speaking to them? So um, I, I run an organization called Eshel. Um, it is about five, six years old. We do retreats for LGBT uh, Jews. Uh, uh, every year we do small Shabbatonim, and we do a large retreat for parents. It just was over a couple of weeks ago. 50 parents came, uh, parents from all over the United States of LGBT kids. Um, Rabbi Rappaport um, generously came and taught. And it was an incredibly powerful experience because uh, the rabbis at home really can't speak the language that they heard at the conference. Uh, now that's not universal, but it's largely true. Indeed, rabbis feel caught or stuck. They sometimes, here's what uh, we're, our discoveries, we're doing a, a welcoming shuls project, which means we interview Orthodox rabbis non-judgmentally. This is what Eshel's doing now. And we're discovering that rabbis are by and large empathetic. But the empathy actually transmits into a kind of superficial desire to be empathetic but a confusion about actually how to do it. Because what does empathy mean when you can come and have an aliyah, but the moment you have a partner, you're really not allowed to articulate that. If you have a partner, that's maybe all right. But when I, my partner and I, um, with surrogacy, brought a baby home from, you know, from India, we brought her to New York City to an Orthodox Beitin, she was converted, and we brought her to Cincinnati, Ohio, and they wouldn't, the rabbi wouldn't mention her name, wouldn't do any service to welcome her. Whether mentioning us or not, we didn't care. Um, and the Chabad asked us to please not bring our daughter to shul, because they could tolerate two men in shul. We don't sit next to each other in shul, but they couldn't tolerate two men taking care of a three-year-old passing her back and forth the way parents do because it was too difficult to... By the way, there was no halachic problem. I want to put in the, the, the clarity here. The claim that the halacha is the problem, I think, is obfuscating. There are halachic issues to deal with, but telling us not to bring our daughter to shul had no halachic import whatsoever. I want to make the following claim, is that there are a growing group of rabbis who are recognizing that if empathy is real, and we really do trust that gay and lesbian people are telling the truth about their experience, then as Yosef Konevsky, a musmach of Yeshiva University said about four years ago, 
then homosexuality is likely a feature of the human condition. And this is his words, and we can no longer justify damaging and harming the physical, emotional, and psychological and religious well-being of gay and lesbian people for our theological comfort. Or Nathan Lopez uh, Cardoza in Israel in the film Trembling Before God. How many people have seen Trembling Before God in the room? It's a powerful film. It's already old. Sandy Dabowski made it about gay and lesbian Orthodox and Hasidic Jews. Um, Nathan Cardoza said, it would be great for all homosexuals to be celibate. There's just one problem. It's completely impossible. The force of human sexuality and the need for companionship is simply too great. And finally, Rabbi Riskin um, said, I think it was 15 years ago, um, if there's a problem uh, with, the, with the kettle, blame the manufacturer. And basically what he said is, gay and lesbian people are under an onus, under a, uh, a force that is not, they're not responsible for, and therefore they should not be given any uh, um, a diminishment of membership, involvement, uh, embrace, and, and, in, and, uh, and inclusion in communities. I want to finish with one story. It was about 10 years ago, and he, this rabbi, Rabbi Shmuel Golden, was soon to be the head of the RCA, the Rabbinic Council of America. And I'm a friend, I went to yeshiva with him, and I said, Shmuel, can we talk about this issue? And he said, sure, come up. So I went up, I said, have you, do you have gay and lesbian people in your shul? He said, yeah, we have a family, we have a, we have a couple of kids, and my heart goes out to them, Steve, but uh, you gotta be celibate. I said, yeah, I know that that's the halachic norm, but I wanna understand how you communicate it. So can we do a role play? He said, sure. I said, okay, I'm 16 years old, my name is Gabe, rabbi, I know I'm gay, and I'm terrified. I'm frightened. What does a Kadosh Baruch Hu want from me? So what are you going to tell me? So he was silent. I said, well, would you tell me what you just said? Uh, Gabe, you will never be touched. You will never touch. You will never dance with someone in joy. You will never be held by someone when you are sad and mourning. You will never have intimacy. You will never make love in joy with someone you cherish because there's something wrong with you. Well, he said, I wouldn't say it like that. So how would you say it, I said to him. Tell me how you say that. Silent. He said, how would you say it? I, I wait for those opportunities to be honest. Okay, how would you say it? I said, try this. Okay, but I too don't know why a loving, merciful, just God makes gay people and then gives them a nearly impossible life. I don't know what I would do in your shoes. I'm not sure I would have the strength to do what you're doing right now. So if you can be celibate without doing harm to yourself, great harm to yourself, you should. But if you can't, and that's likely, then you keep 612 meets vote and you go to Shemayim with a damn good argument. A Kalish Baruch who is merciful, join my shul. I want you in my shul. Could you say that? He said, I think I could. I said, can I push you one more step? He laughed. He said, okay. I said, could you tell Gabe the following? Gabe, I'm, I'm 40 years or more older than you. I'll probably be in Shamayim when you offer your, your defense of your life in front of the Kisei Kavod in front of the Holy Throne. I want to make you a promise right now. When you do that, I will be behind you, right behind you, cheering you on. And he began to cry. Because the issue isn't empathy. It's just not enough. The issue is, imo you have to be with that 16-year-old in the feeling of alienation and confusion and terror about a future. And whatever you say has to be guided by your complete existential commitment to the crisis that that kid is in and your responsibility for him. I tell parents all the time, the rabbi's job is halacha. You can let him figure out halacha. Your job 
is the protection of the well-being of your kids, and you must demand from the rabbi that he share that concern with you fully. So rabbis need to do that. They need to fully get the existential crisis that a young gay kid is in, and otherwise, if they don't, two things will happen. There will be people who will, by the way, not only gay people, but their friends, their, their siblings. We have siblings who have left Yiddishkeit because their brothers were treated badly. Families leave communities. And I have a convert who wrote me, he wants to convert to Judaism, completely religious. And if he has to say that the law in Leviticus is fully justified, he will not convert because he will not convert into a religion that is cruel to his cousin. So I want to put it on the table to you, is that I don't know how to solve the halakhic challenges, and they're formidable, and I don't mean to sideline them, but they are aside from our commitment to include every last human being in all their colorful diversity under tachas kanfei ashkina, to create a community that is truly, deeply committed to welcoming everyone. So Carol, there's, there's been a, you know, a number of comments here talking about um, uh, a kind of ambivalent empathy, right? There's, there's empathy and yet there's resistance. Um, Rabbi Rappaport alluded to it earlier when the man said to him, you know, I don't want your book, I don't even want to know the name of the book. Um, you know, Rabbi Greenberg has alluded to it here, you've alluded to it in your comments. So it, there's a bit of a split, right? There's a contradiction taking place in the relationship of orthodoxy to the LGBT community. On the one hand, there's a lot of talk about changing attitudes and more acceptance. The topic's more out in the open. On the other hand, I mean, speaking personally, there, there really weren't, um, you know, we weren't, let's say, welcomed with open arms by the orthodox synagogues of Toronto to host the program. And the, the thing of it is, is that I kind of understand that. I, w I was told by several well-meaning rabbis, very good people, very sincere, hardworking, wonderful people, that would be too difficult politically with their congregations, and they're right, it would be. So how do we get past the resistance of just talking about it? I mean, in other words, we're, we're not talking about solving it or, or you know, radically changing Jewish law. Ju just talking about it seems to be the first stumbling block. How do we, how do we get past that? Wow, if I knew the answer to that one. Um, you know, it just is so great to hear Rabbi Greenberg's advocacy and how he's able to talk with other rabbis and with other people. And I feel that tonight is a baby step, but I think we can do better. I think that, you know, we are the light onto the nations. And yet, today when I got my newspaper, there was an entire supplement in the city of Toronto there's not one gay pride parade. There wasn't one gay pride day. We're having an entire month here in Toronto, the entire month of June. Margaret Atwood is one of the speakers. Every corporate sponsor is lined up, Air Canada, TD. Um, we're very proud as Canadians that we've gone this far with LGBT issues, but the Jewish community, unfortunately, um, can say that they welcome LGBT kids people, but the fact that we are not in an orthodox shul tonight feels to me like it's just not good enough. It's my shul, it's your shul, that's where we should be. What a statement that would have been tonight. Yes, this is a baby step, but it just feels that we could be doing a lot more. Um, last fall, I was really taken aback when my son, who could have had free tickets to high holiday services, said, you know what? At my age, working, I would like to support the shul and I'd like to buy those tickets. And I felt so happy that as a parent of a gay son that he wanted to be at an Orthodox shul and buy those tickets because he said, I grew up in an Orthodox shul. This is where I feel comfortable. This is where my family is. This is where my family friends are. And I really felt good about that. I think that if he knew tonight, he's out of town on business, but if he knew tonight that we are holding this event in Associated, which is fantastic. He's an alumnus of Associated, but not at our shul 
or any Orthodox shul in Toronto, I think that it would be extremely demoralizing, as it is to me and as it probably is to everybody here. Elliot, I don't have an answer, except that I wish I could speak like Stephen Greenberg. But um, I think that every person in this room who came out, whether in your life or by coming to this program, who is, as I said earlier, who is live streaming, all of this takes courage. And if we speak up, as Margaret McCain taught me to do 15 years ago, when we hear slurs, if we in our own way can be activists in our own way and speak openly, this is my third panel. It's my first in the Jewish community, but it's my third panel as a parent of an LGBT person. Um, every one of us doing more and speaking in the Jewish community, we touch one life at a time, and all of a sudden, you know, from a very small micro movement, we have something going on much, much bigger. And I think that that is part of it, that we make the personal political. And we all have that ability, um, each and every one of us, to do it in our own way. So obviously it would be remiss <laughs> to ha have this panel talk about this subject and not talk about sexuality. Um, so that's what I'd like to do. Um, Rabbi Greenberg, you alluded to the, uh, the very sort of thorny dilemma that you placed before Rabbi Golden, and just the dilemma of, of um, what seems to be the, uh, the rock and the hard place, right? Where if the Torah is explicitly talking about um, a prohibition on uh, gay sex, or at least gay intercourse, and the option of celibacy, which obviously seems like a... Um, from my point of view, a virtual impossibility since sexual identity is such a core expression of the human being. And Rabbi Rappaport, in your book, um, you talk about celibacy and whether that's an option for, um, and, and I think you look at it almost as a kind of heroic option. I'm not sure if you see it as realistic for people, but it seems to be the thing that you advise um, in your book. So I think I'd like to start with you. Um, I guess it's a two-part question. If, if you see the, and, and you seem to very explicitly in the book, see the prohibition as unequivocal and non-interpretable, the only options left then would be to break the law or to be celibate, um, neither of which seem to be very palatable options. Um, I wonder if you could comment. How do you see this? It's a broad sweep that you've asked me to address here. I, um, it is clear that uh, in the rabbinic tradition, uh, throughout the ages, the original, the classical rabbinic writings and halachic writings and more recent writings, uh, the verses in Leviticus chapters 18 and 20 have always been understood to forbid uh, sexual liaison between two men. And therefore, even if someone were to come up with another interpretation of the verse, or suggest that the verse didn't, wasn't really uh, referring to what it has been understood, as an Orthodox Jew, our allegiance is to the totality of halacha, not just uh, the scriptural verse, but the entire body of halacha that has developed since then. And therefore, I for one cannot see any way how one could understand it or practically implement it in another way. As uh, your own rabbi said here before, this is cast in stone in the halacha and Hatayra has is later The Torah will not be changed. Now, here comes the question. Because can a person live with a feeling of hypocrisy, a feeling of disharmony, a feeling of tension uh, between his religious beliefs? and his religious and his practices, 
between his orientation and his faith? Can this be? Can a person engage in such a relationship? Personally, I believe that most religious people actually do. Whether they are heterosexual or homosexual, most of us are far from perfect, and we live with tensions. We live with tensions in our faith, and in our belief in the ability to find inner peace and harmony with everything we do that also reflects the truths of the Torah. I don't think gay people are alone in that. And what I would say to a gay person is, if you don't feel able to live in accordance with this halacha, that doesn't mean that you should throw out the baby with the bathwater. There are gay people in the Haredi community, there are gay people in the modern Orthodox community, there are gay people in every Hasidic community, and there are gay people in every society, every color, every race. There are gay people who live celibate lives, there are gay people who practice and live in, have sexual relationships. And by the way, the same is true for heterosexual people. That there are heterosexual people also confronted with great, very difficult situations. People who couldn't find a spouse or couldn't find the right uh, spouse that was religiously permitted to them. Or numerous situations. And again, it's very difficult and it's very challenging, but there are two choices. Some rabbis would prefer uh, to say to them, we don't need you. Leave. It is my very firm belief and conviction that is wrong. And where do you draw the line? Perhaps I should also leave because I don't live to a perfect standard. What I know is that the struggle is enormous and I would also characterize the proposition of a lifelong celibacy to be near impossible, near impossible for gay people and near impossible for straight people. It doesn't make any difference. Have people been confronted with this challenge before? Yes. Has anyone been able to live up to this challenge and at the same time remain sane. There have been, and there are, few and far between, but it is a rarity. Because of the, because of the strength of the sexual drive and the need for love and the need for companionship, for intimacy within the human being. So, would I then, with most people who ask my advice, what I discuss with them is not the ideal, but to try and find a way, A, of say, well, what can we do? What can you do? Many Orthodox gay people would like to reach a situation where they feel that they don't at least violate the biblical commandment, and many people even if they can't do that, would like to find some way of being able to feel that they are still able to remain within the Orthodox community. They can be fully part of a shul, they can daven for the Omid, they can get an aliyah, etc., etc. It is unfair that sometimes <laughs> there are, there's a ridiculous situation where even people, orthodox people who don't have any partners, they just happen to be gay by orientation, uh, and they are refused alias in some shuls, or they're refused uh, uh, some other honor. You asked before why it is that the shuls are still so scared. Why could this evening's event not take place in a shul? 
I want to give a few answers to that. Of course, there is the fear that maybe someone on the panel will say something which is not in accordance with halakha, and then the shul will be blamed. There is the fear, I'm sure on behalf of many orthodox shuls, that uh, this is it's unknown territory. In previous generations, people didn't discuss it. We don't know what's going to happen. The fear of the unknown. So we push it under the carpet. But I think that there is also the fear the, that some rabbis have because they don't know how many of their own congregants are actually facing the challenges that we're discussing tonight. And when I speak to a young gay man who comes to my office with great trepidation usually, I say to him, go and speak to your rabbi. Go and speak to your rebbe. Go and speak to your Rosh Hashiva. And he's terrified. Usually, when they do go and confide, they are met with warmth and acceptance rather than with rejection. They're not always met with the correct advice. There's a lot of times when people give them the wrong advice. Believe it or not, there are some rabbis who will still say to a young gay man, go and marry a woman, and uh, it'll be fine. And in this way, they wreak havoc to the man, to the woman, and to any future children that are born from this union. But, in the context of the question you asked me, it's extremely important that the rabbis know they know that there are people, and one rabbi said to me, if I knew there was any gay people in my shul, I would throw them out. Little did he know that one of the people that came to his daf Yomishia every single day was gay. So what I'm saying is, is that there has never been the encounter. It's important that rabbis get to know their gay membership. Understandably, many young gay people are reluctant. First of all, why should they suffer the risk of being hurt? And second of all, why should they suffer the risk of perhaps being second-rate citizens in the shul? On the other hand, the only way that rabbis will actually feel compelled by the importance of engaging in this discussion is if they know the gay members of their synagogue and their children, children of their members. If the gay person is in the rabbi's eyes, a distant stranger, someone who marches down a, a peculiar parade, or uh, lives in San Francisco in a completely different lifestyle, of course, he doesn't feel the need to host an evening in his shul. If he knows that there are people in his community, amongst his constituents, who face the challenges that we're addressing here, then sooner or later, he will feel ready to address them too. Now, I acknowledge it's a vicious circle, because to the extent that at the moment the atmosphere is not welcoming, many, many homosexually orientated people will not speak to the rabbi. And uh, the rabbi will then continue, possibly, to stick his hand in the sa head in the sand, or at least not to address the issues properly. But the only way that the issues will be addressed is through confrontation. 
I don't, I mean, through encounter, I should use confrontation as the sense of, uh, uh, through encounter. And this encounter can only be facilitated by young men and women who are orthodox, devoutly orthodox, and come to their rabbis and say very clearly, we want to be orthodox. We want to remain orthodox. We want to live as much as we feel able to live in accordance with orthodoxy. Now, so that's, once that, that, that's, that, that's the, the solution for, for that problem. Coming back originally to the, question, to the question that you originally asked me, I'm not, um, uh, just like I know that um, despite the laws, for example, against extramarital sex, people are trapped in uh, marriages in which there is no intimacy are not going to remain celibate, usually. The same is true, I know that there are laws against premarital sex, but people who are never able to get married are not usually going to live their lives as celibate. And the same is true with gay people. We are all sexual people, it's just that people are wired differently. It's not a question of uh, a, a different human being. We're all human. And in this case, we're all Jewish. So, what works for one works for another. The halacha itself must be understood in the sense that halacha, law, legality, never really makes any exceptions. If, uh, if there is a law against a particular union or a particular relationship, for whichever reason that law was made, as the Rambam writes in the guide, the halacha is designed according to the majority. Which, of course, does sometimes, not just in this area, but in other areas, put the minority into great difficulty. Just to give a hop in, okay. I'm going to get back to you um, because something you said tweaked something else for me. Um, and here I'd like to actually turn back to uh, Yeshaya. Um, you described growing up um, a tension inside of yourself that was very difficult to resolve, um, where you began to recognize, acknowledge, and admit to yourself your identity, um, in which you actually turn to God, but you turn to God to actually help him to sort of take away this identity. And it sounds to me as you've grown older that there's been a kind of maturation of that process and a more of an acceptance of that identity, which also led to speaking about it. So I'm wondering how you feel now, um, hearing everybody speak about love and sexual expression in your life, um, uh, genuine sexual expression that fits your identity, both in terms of how you think about it for what you want for yourself and also how you think about it in terms of that sort of difficult, complex reconciliation with your, with your Jewishness, your Judaism. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess, as, I, as you mentioned, I did have a maturation of sorts, and um, I think it goes back to that summer where I ultimately realized that um, the feelings that I had were real and that ultimately that they were good. I guess I just innately felt that they were good. It's hard to explain. I guess when you're attracted to someone, you kind of just feel like it's a good thing. Um, I think something else I realized was that what I was going... What I was going through then was uh, pretty much what most of my friends went through when they were 16 or 17. And in general, I think, I think my experience is really much the same as all other um, people in this room even. Um, I think that that kind of plays into the conflict with Judaism where 
um, my feelings and really everything else about me and all of my complexity um, is very similar to everyone else here. Um, I just happen to be attracted to guys, whereas the majority of men are attracted to girls. But in terms of the actual attraction, that's the same. But Judaism seems to be saying that that is not the case, at least Orthodox Judaism at the moment. Um, it seems to be saying that it's not the case that my feelings are not the same as other people's and therefore they don't deserve to be recognized as the same and that um, I can't, for example, or I should be celibate or if you're not saying that, at least that, hold that holding that up as an ideal is kind of, um, it's not really addressing the issues at hand, Re ultimately realizing that um, I am the same person I was before, and I also have the same feelings as um, heterosexual people. Um, I guess I've kind of gone through, again, what most people went through when they were younger, um, maybe not in very religious circles, um, but I kind of, uh, I do feel that there was a lack of guidance because I don't really have anyone to turn to to give a serious response into how to act on my feelings. Um, some people, I don't know, I guess no one has told me to be Shomer Nagia with guys or if that's a legitimate expression of my sexuality, which I personally don't think it is. Um, but I guess I, I haven't been able to turn to anyone because I don't feel that anyone um, properly addresses the issues. Um, that being said, over that summer, I kind of, um, I had, well, before the summer, I had the impression that kind of God was good and that my feelings were bad. Um, over that summer, I realized that my feelings were good innately and therefore it kind of flipped and um, I got angry at God. Um, I thought God was bad. How could he do this to me? Um, it was also after a friend's wedding, and it was kind of, everyone was so happy for them, and they were so happy, and it was kind of like dangling pure happiness in front of me and saying, you can't have this. Um, so, yeah, I did. I was angry at God, and I thought God was bad. Um, fortunately, I went to Yom Kippur service, and the rabbi in Montreal actually spoke about how we have to let go of our anger towards our enemies, our anger towards our friends, and even our anger towards God, which resonated with me. And um, I guess I realized how much I love Judaism, and it's always been a part of my life, and it has so much value to me. And just because I might not understand everything doesn't mean that I have to give it up. Uh, that being said, I guess so I, I saw God as good again. However, my feelings were still good. So instead of, um, I guess the way I understood it is that it must be our interpretation of God's word. Um, that is not correct. Uh, so I guess I personally have an understanding that works for me. And um, yeah, I guess I feel that that, um, I mean, I don't know if I would suggest it for everyone, but it works for me and I'm able to, to reconcile or reconcile my own Judaism, personal Judaism um, with my sexuality. However, that being said, I guess I'm still struggling with the fact that it seems that there's a systematic um, almost oppression by mainstream, mainstream Orthodox Judaism um, that, I mean, Rabbi Rappaport mentioned several other examples of people who just don't happen to be married, but I think it's the difference of the system being against you and not, being, not allowing you to express your, your true love and um, sexuality. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point out also that I think Rabbi Karopkin spoke about kind of this gay lifestyle, and I mean, that doesn't make sense to me at all because my lifestyle is the lifestyle of mo most people here. Um, it's the lifestyle of having a family and children and teaching your values, and that's the lifestyle that I want to have.
it seems to me, Rabbi Greenberg, that we've kind of reached the heart of the matter here. Um, the discussion has two separate elements, and one seems um, worse off the top, but it maybe suggests a solution. That's the sociological issue, right? Be nicer, be more empathic, be more accepting, feel their pain. So even if the community for the moment or has been for a long time um, neglectful of this, one can imagine, one can envision with enough communication and enough articulation that people can get it. But the theological halachic dilemma, which in some ways to me is the heart of the matter, that's more thorny. You said something very, very interesting here, Yeshaya. You said that, if I understand you correctly in so many words, that to salvage your relationship with God, you felt that it was necessary internally to begin to think that perhaps Judaism, so to speak, had gotten God wrong. Right, right, in that case. And that to me is where the slippery slope begins in so many areas in so many ways. Um, and I find myself deeply conflicted about this and I think any thinking person would be. So I guess Rabbi Greenberg, what I wanna ask you, um, is whether we can square the circle here. In other words, all of you are talking in different ways about the fact that Judaism makes these demands. And all of you in the same breath are talking about the fact that it's almost impossible for a human being to accept these demands. So something has to give, right? Either the religion is seen as uh, whatever adjective you want to use, wrong, um, um, making it impossible. I'm just reflecting the words that I've heard this evening. Um, there's something very, very troubling about that because we'd now be saying that Judaism got it wrong. So are we saying that the price we pay for allowing for gay people not just to be accepted but to actually have full sexual expression is to say that our religion has gotten it wrong. And once we make that statement, it now opens up everything. All the can of worms comes tumbling out possibly. Um, I wonder if you can address that. Okay, so um, we have all night here, I, I suppose, if that's the case. That was a joke, but it's all right. Um, so I wrote a book called Wrestling with God and Men, Homosexuality in the Jewish Tradition. It's available on Amazon. I, I spent two-thirds of the book not addressing a halachic question, but addressing a mythopoetic question, the mytho, like the pre-halachic question. And that is, we have no question to ask if the healthy, thoughtful gay person who's orthodox basically decides, there is no home for me. God calls my inner life to Eva. I want love and companionship, and therefore I don't want in. I don't want in anymore. This is, used to be the scenario that if you were orthodox and gay, you were either silent and stayed or, were, or spoke up and left, and so, there's a it's kind of need for an Orthodox person to come up with a way of understanding the verses, whether or not it's approved, in order to hold on to God, which is exactly what you heard from Yeshaya. So the first two thirds of the book are basically working through the psukim. I mean, you look through the book of Genesis, and there's no reference to homosexual relations that isn't violent. And then you find a, a, a chazal, a beautiful chazal, which basically say that there were four kings who were so uh, arrogant they called themselves God and they were punished with anal rape. In other words, it turns out that homosexual relations in the ancient world is identified with violence and humiliation and degradation. And indeed, I found that to be true. And so might it be possible, it's a much more complex kind of por portrayal in the book, but might it be possible that one reason that homosexual relationships are toeva is that they were understood within an ancient frame of the humiliation of a vulnerable male by another male. Now, if that's the case, that, that kind of sequesters the isur, at least in its worst forms, to prison sex, to, you know, to Abu Ghraib. There's also, you know, Rabbi Yishmael suggests in the Gemara, that the vulnerable, the receptive partner is only chayiv within the context of, of uh, you know, uh, Kadesha or Kadesh. In other words, 
pagan frames of sexual relations which were common in the ancient world. That might be an expression. In other words, here's what I do with the first, you know, kind of two thirds of the book, is claim if I'm gay, in order to not self-undermine my, like to not undermine my own soul, I've got to believe that God knows I'm all right, even if the rabbis have not gotten it yet. And that's what allows me to stay. The rabbi doesn't have to agree with me. You don't have to agree with me. I got to know that I am loved and embraced, and God gets my soul and made me this way. And I've got textual corroboration for it because the text basically is describing a single act between men which is identified with violence and humiliation, not two people who are finding love and establishing committed loving relationships. So I admit in the book, that's not a halachic answer. It doesn't, that will not open orthodox doors in, their, in orthodox communities. That will open our hearts to remain at home. What opens orthodox doors is a much more limited frame. Um, it's the frame of basically one, you know, rationale offered by Rabbi Riskin and by others is onus rachmana patre, that the merciful one does not hold those under duress uh, uh, culpable for their, for their crimes. It's not the perfect solution, but it hap happens to actually be articulated by a number of post -game that at least some, if not all, you know, sincere gay folks m might be considered under a psychological duress that makes their behavior not culpable, fully culpable in, in the eyes of God, and therefore we have no right to hold them accountable to their behavior. Now, it's insufficient for all kinds of reasons because that means that I'm, you know, kind of psychologically deficient. It's not perfect, but here's the point. I want to walk into a shul where the rabbi says, I've got a good halachic rationale for basically saying, you're doing the best you can and you're not an active violator of Shabbos l'shem shema. Like, you're not like trying to destroy halacha. You're just being human and it must be really hard. So onus, you're under a duress and we accept you. We, I mean, rabbi Rappaport has a similar frame, which is tinok shenishbai. It means that the larger culture kind of holds you at, you know, in a, in, a, in a frame that makes it difficult for you to overcome your desires. The, in either way, whether the, the, whether the force is psychological or social, it doesn't really matter. What matters is, is that this is the way the Orthodox community can begin something I believe it needs to do, which is to say we have no right to judge a human being in a very different emotional, experiential frame, and therefore, we're gonna allow gay people in the shul. In fact, we're gonna welcome them. Not only that, we're gonna welcome couples. Not only that, we're gonna welcome families. And when they celebrate bar and bat mitzvah, we're gonna let them celebrate because they are doing what they can given their reality. That may not be fully how I understand myself, but that is enough for me to belong to an Orthodox shul. Just accept, by the way, I wanna add one other point, and that is, do you need to actively shame me in order to feel good about halacha? Like, that's the question. Not calling Steve and me and our daughter a family, is that a halachic rule? No. But my shul now, the young Israel of Brookline, is struggling whether that's possible. I respect the debate they're having. But I want to know, what's the point? I really, I don't understand. Like, what is it to call us a family because we're acting like one. I mean, I, like I get up in the morning and I make her breakfast and we do her laundry and I kind of figure out what to do when she has a fever and it looks like a family to me. So my question is, can we stop framing every one of these issues as the halachic problem? What people do in their bedrooms, no rabbi is coming with a camp, well, let's say some rabbis might, but no rabbi, normal rabbi, is coming with a camera to look. And therefore what happens is, is that what you do in your bedroom is your piety between you, your spouse, and God. Rabbis don't give people who don't keep Tarat HaMishpacha a hard time to join their shul. Because we recognize that while there are halachic demands upon the bedroom, they are for a couple to work out with each other and God. So leave us to our privacy too. 
don't ask us what we do. You can tell us what you believe the halakha is and then welcome us in full arms with ex in exactly the same way as you welcome Shandy and Yosef. We're really not all that different, right? So my claim would be is that we have made of one psukim in the Torah an entire edifice of fear around gender and sexuality that is not about halakha at all but about the larger fears around structure and order that have to do with other issues that are not actually, um, in my mind, uh, um, uh, coextensive with the halachic commitment to love thy neighbor as thyself, to not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor, right? To trust that every human being is truly in the image of God. Okay, so I'm going, to be, I'm going to be wrapping it up here shortly. Um, if you have questions, um, I guess you can write them down, bring them up, and time permitting, I'll get in a few. Um, I, I want to end on, on um, something else I've heard all evening, and I want to actually address this to Dr. Kornblum and also Rabbi Rappaport. Um, several times it's been talked about the notion of whether gay people can change, can become straight, um, whether this is hardwired, whether this is sociologically conditioned. Um, uh, so uh, the best I can understand from the stuff I've read from, you know, the APA and, and others is that nobody, I believe, um, has used the phrase that it is hardwired. Um, no scientists and the president of the APA who deals with LGBT will not use that phrase either. However, the studies they did in the Genome Project do suggest um, strong inclination, strong orientation towards um, being gay, such that it would also be erroneous to call it the kind, a choice in the way we usually use that word. That's the way I understand it. Given that, it seems that the attempt, let's say, therapeutically to say, well, our, our ideal here would be to take a, a gay person and make them heterosexual, might be um, misguided. I, I'm saying this because there was a popular therapy known as reparative therapy some years ago. It seems to be um, that there's been an attitudinal shift, not just in the psychological community, but even in the orthodox community. So I'm wondering if you can explain for me what the goal of reparative therapy was and, and why you feel it may not be advisable? Um, <clears throat> so obviously I can't speak for the rabbinical community, so I'll speak for the psychological yeah. community. <clears throat> that so-called, uh, and there's two terms that are used, one is conversion therapy and the other is reparative therapy. There are some differences, but often they're used together and synonymously. The problem is that, that, that they're based on two assumptions. One is that homosexuality per se is a problem that it's a mental disorder or a disease worthy of treating. That's one assumption. And the other is that one could do so. <clears throat> and as study after study after study has shown, both of those assumptions are false. So A, homosexuality is not a disorder or pathology. It was removed from the psychiatric nomenclature in 1973 and fortunately has not made a reappearance since then. So it's no longer regarded as a mental illness, although it was up until 1973. And study after study has shown that it's impossible to reprogram or deprogram someone who is homosexual. It's not a choice. It's, it's not, uh, in the normal course of events, conditioned. Uh, and, and that was the assumption that it was, if you go by the learning theory, that it, if something is conditioned, then it can be unlearned or unconditioned. But all the evidence is showing that is I don't know why people aren't calling it hardwired. I would. So it's, it's intrinsic, it's temperamental, it's constitutional. Whatever you want to call it, I would call it hardwired. Um, lots of research needs to be done on why that's so, just as lots of research needs to be done on why heterosexual brains are wired the way they are, they are wired. So it's just part of, I think, curiosity. We need to do more research on neuroscience. But... Um, Conversion or reparative therapy has, in, in my view, a very unfortunate and ugly history. 
in psychiatry and psychology. Um, attempts have been made to change um, gay people into straight people through lobotomy, chemical castration, aversive treatment like applying electric shock to the genitals, uh, nausea-inducing drugs being given and shown when you're shown homoerotic stimuli. Um, you know, the Attorney General of the United States said a number of years ago, it sh let's call it what it is, which is torture. Um, so it, not only is it ineffective, uh, studies have been shown that it makes people worse. I mean, another example of it was in the time of Freud, there was a Viennese endocrinologist who thought that this could be done by transplanting testicles from straight men into gay men. Okay, and this was done at the time of Freud. Freud himself did not think that homosexuality was changeable, nor, per se, that it was an illness. Uh, so I'll just briefly quote one example that in 1935, a mother uh, of a gay boy sent a letter to Freud and asked him to treat her son. And this was his response. This was in 1935. I gather from your letter <clears throat> that your son is a homosexual. It is nothing to be ashamed of, no vice, no degradation. It cannot be classified as an illness. We consider it as a variation of the sexual function. By asking me if I can help your son, you mean, I suppose, if I can abolish his homosexuality and make heterosexuality take its place. The answer is, we cannot promise to achieve it. Um, in a certain number, in a, in the answer is in a general way, we cannot promise to achieve it. In a certain number of cases, we might succeed in further developing the germs of heterosexual tendencies, but in the majority of cases, it is no more possible. It is a question of the quality and the age of the individual. Um, and in another uh, place, Freud says, it's as uh, possible to achieve that as the reverse. If we were to try and make a straight person gay, would we be successful? No. Um, so that, that was Freud's view, and so conversion or reparative therapy has fallen into disrepute. A, for being ineffective, and B, for being harmful. So we're going to wrap report. We just have a, a brief few minutes left, but they are yours. Okay, so uh, I would like to say, uh, first of all, with regard to the question of therapy, because I, I'm approached by many young people and their parents and their families. In general terms, um, I agree that a confirmed homosexual cannot be changed. I do, however, believe that there is a large margin in between um, of all sorts of, there is a sort of fluid stages of sexuality that often kick in with teenagers. There are there's, of course, bisexuality and different levels of that. There is opportunist sexuality which takes place depending on, like in yeshivas or places where there are very few opportunities for heterosexuality. And there might be some cases in which uh, a therapeutic model may help, but it would all be where there was some indication to start with that the person had a heterosexual interest. Uh, so the person might have had an experience which made him have a stronger proclivity towards um, uh, homosexual, uh, homosexual, but there is still an option. In the vast majority of cases, the therapy has not been useful. And um, I've said to a number of therapists who argued against me, public meetings, that ultimately they have to ask themselves the question, um, would they let a young man who was gay and gone through this reparative therapy marry their daughter? And uh, I think that's a, a very telling moment because at the, at the end of the day, as far as Judaism is concerned, reparative therapy would mean to encourage the person to get married. And unless reparative therapy can be is proven to be long-term effective, then it doesn't really enable the model of marriage to take place. I wanted to uh, say a couple of other things and about the, the 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 question that Rabbi the Doctor Malamut asked before. I think that um, I understand fully 
um, the challenges, the theological tension that must exist in the mind of a homosexual, uh, especially a young man, a young adolescent. And I didn't mean, Yeshaya, for a moment to suggest that the challenges of uh, uh, straight people are the same. What I feel is, though, that, yes, that is ultimately the question, can one, can one live with tension? There are people in the Jewish community, in the Orthodox community today, who have all sorts of questions about theology. They waver. They, are, uh, studied, they have problems with scientific problems based on biblical criticism, based on... Uh, moral objections to certain commandments in the Torah. These are real dilemmas, tensions that many modern Jews have. And many modern Jews remain committed to Torah despite the fact that in the heart of hearts they have dilemmas, unresolved issues, theological issues, things which they cannot, they might find partial answers, but they're not able to find a wholesome picture to solve. Um, and what I'm saying is, yes, that I, I fully appreciate why it would be much easier for a person to throw the towel in. The challenge of a relationship, the success of a relationship, is not about the ability to always understand everything. It's about ability to relate even when we don't understand um, each other. And the same is true to a certain extent. If understanding and full logical cognitive comfort with all the assertions of Orthodox Judaism would be a prerequisite to remaining within the fold, I guess that half of us will be out of the room. I, I sustain that there is a much deeper, a much more subliminal pull, magnetic pull, that encourages people, and that drives people. Just like love cannot always be explained, so too the ultimate religious impulse is something innate, a word that was used before. It goes much deeper, much higher than arguments. The fact, however, what I do want to say is, as a word of encouragement is that I personally believe that ultimately, not that arguments don't play a role, those Jews who leave Yiddishkeit, whether they're straight or gay, yes, the arguments combine, combine but it's the inability to live with that tension, possibly, or other emotional reasons. Those people that stay, it is because the Yiddish guide means so much to them. And they see, they feel, they believe, they have the faith that this is what flows in their bloodstream to give them vitality. That irrespective of tensions and questions, they're able to remain. I don't judge anyone. I just pray that people should be given the strength of faith to be able to persevere in the face of all challenges. So um, I'm going to be calling on Rabbi Strachler, I, I hope he's still here, um, to give some closing remarks. I want to say two things. First of all, um, my gratitude uh, to all of you for coming and showing your support. Uh, I want to say that I'm very proud of everybody on the panel. You did well. And uh, let's give them a warm hand. like to begin by echoing Elliot's sentiments and to say thank you to the panelists for being so honest and open about your experiences and about your insights. 
I can speak as for myself, as a, a rabbi, as a, a Jew, that I very much want to be with Rabbi Golden in that conversation with uh, Rabbi Greenberg, to be able to argue on behalf of my people, to be able to be a person who can join in that conversation on behalf of people who have theological questions in Shemayim. And I think that the ability to hold the tension that Rabbi Rappaport described so beautifully, to be able to hold questions, to be able to understand that there are things in our faith that are beyond us, and that we struggle to be able to grasp them as best we can, but yet we hope and pray that there is within us something innate, something that drives us towards our Creator, that drives us to seek meaning in our lives, to seek purpose, is something that we should aspire to. The question that I'd like to pose to each of you here is where do we go from here? And I believe that it is crucial that we go to that place together as a community, that it take place through conversations, that it take place through the support that uh, people in this room wish they had when they were younger, and uh, God willing will be support that we will provide for each other going forward. But the, the hope that I would put before you is the hope that we are able to uh, take upon ourselves the responsibility to care for one another, to be a community that sees one another as family. And as we face these challenges, as we uh, look to um, the challenges of faith in every generation, that we gain strength from one another. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night.